Greetings, I'm Mike Haddock and today I'm going to start a little series on the masonry business. And one of the, a lot of people who watch my videos always ask me how I go bid in a job. How much does this job cost? How do you bid a job? Uh, and it's mostly geared towards uh, guys just starting so you get an idea of what's uh, is going on. How I do it, I might not be the guy that you want to hear do it, but this is the way I do it. At the end of the video, I'm going to show you how I write a little contract for a homeowner. And the next video will be a little different, but this one I'm just going to uh, concentrate on the basics of bidding a job and how I do it. Uh, at my age, I don't really go looking for work. I'm well established. I never answer my landline. I always get my jobs through somebody who knows me personally and calls me on my cell phone. And most of the jobs I do do today for maybe strangers or something is from someone who knows me down the line from someone else. And sometimes a lot of my friends or contractors will call me up and say, uh, Mike, so-and-so uh, is looking to get a job done right now. Could I give them your phone number and call you up? There's a lot of different ways to bid on a job. There's time and material. Uh, sometimes what I do is I'll have the owners buy the materials. Uh, sometimes I'll bid everything into the job. It all, de it all depends on the job. And I don't want every job. I only want jobs that is going to be good for me and hopefully good for them. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I got a call through a, a person I've done a lot of work for and they said, well my brother, they have a house up the lake and uh, they want to get their steps fixed. So as a courtesy, I, the guy called me on the phone and I went up and I went down, there was a couple steps crumbled. It was way down this hill. It was all, they must have built the house years ago and then they landscaped the whole hill and what they did was they parked their cars up on top of the road so they had steps going up to the road. I went down, I look at the steps. I figured I could, I could uh, fix them in one day. You know, I told the guy like 250 bucks, whatever. And he says, well, that's not really what I want is I want them all torn out I want a bigger porch, a new foundation, and I want a patio with steps and everything. And I said, uh, you know, I said, I, I'm not geared up for that. I says, I don't have the machines to get down here. I appreciate you offering me the job, and I'm way behind in work, and I can't do that. The real reason I didn't take that job was because it was on a mountain coming down. There's no way I could get a machine down there. I seen everything was landscaped and uh, I'd have to rip that all out, I'd have to rip the porch out, it's going to rain, it's going to be a mud house, it's a disaster. So I don't take jobs like that. I look for jobs that are easy. It's easy to get the concrete truck up there. It's easy to get the material up there. Yes, I'm very, very careful on what jobs I take because you get a lot of people mad at you because you didn't get done in time and sometimes it's the weather. Another reason, another thing is the weather. I'm not going to take a job right before November hits. I just did, I just finished a job on a patio for a guy who was a good friend of mine, a, a builder. He started the patio, he didn't even tell me. It was December already and my rule, my rule of thumb is I don't take any stone patios after November 1st. There's no way because the weather could turn on you on a dime I stopped my concrete work October, uh, November 1st. As a matter of fact, if it's a stone patio, I might do the concrete work and then I'll say I'm not starting a stone till the spring because you're up against the weather and it could ruin you. So the first thing I should say is you got to pick your jobs strategically. Uh, usually when I go to bid on a job and I know it might be a disaster like that, I say, well, you know, I'm really busy and I'm really backed up. But as a courtesy, I'll come and I'll look at the job. And then when I get there and I look at it and I don't want it, then I already had my excuse in place. I don't pick heavy jobs no more. I did my last block job, hopefully. I don't pick up heavy stuff anymore. I'm too old for that. But getting right down into uh, the money part of it, you know, I try to get jobs anymore. And there's a good saying. It's very true. Because I bid on a lot of type of jobs. Uh, I remember like Best Buy came into town and they, they called me up to do the masonry work. And I've done work for convenience stores. I've done work, work for union companies. I've done work for just 
you know, fixing an old lady's steps for 60 bucks because she didn't have any money. Uh, I did a lot of work for builders. I did work for developers. You got to know who you're working for. And I don't take big jobs, but that little saying hanging up on your wall, stay small and keep it all. Because I watch a lot of guys, big guys, they get these big dreams, they're going to go into a big construction business. Two, three years later, they're bankrupt. Now, I like them one, two, or three day jobs where you're there and then you're gone. Uh, steps is are easy, stucco jobs, painting the wall, they're great jobs because you're not tied up. And if you get into delays, that can ruin everything. And then everybody will call you the same day. So I'm my mindset is I like to take a job that I'm sure I can do at a certain time, I can complete it, and I can be gone. So anyway, I get up there and I'll say to the owner, listen, uh, they'll ask me the job and everything. And sometimes I'll, I'll say right then and there, I'll say, you know what? I measured it. I looked at it. I got to think about this for a few days. I just can't sometimes just give them a bid right there. I'll say, I got to think about it for a few days. But if it's a one, two, or three day job and it's just stucco, well, stucco, there's very little uh, money involved as far as materials go. So I won't ask for no money down. You know, I don't like doing that. Other contractors, they want, you know, so much down. Uh, the Attorney General's office here in Pennsylvania, they have a law that you cannot take more than one third down. I don't like to take money in front of pe before people. A lot of the customers I have, and I do mean that, customers, because as you grow in a business, you're going to develop a customer base. What I do is I, uh, I look at the job, like I said, one, two, or three day job. It might be uh, six, seven hundred, anything under a thousand dollars, very little material. I know them. I don't I do not ask for any money down. Uh, I'll wait until the job is done and then I'll get my money. Now if it's a job where it's a special thing, thing like we did this house out of stone and it was fake stone. It wasn't the whole house, it was just the front. I, I wanted to sell them real stone because I know it's better, it's cheaper. They wanted a certain kind of stone. I said, okay. I said, will you buy the stone? I said, you get that. And then the only thing I got is my time and material two, three days to do the job, what could I really lose on it? I, I mostly pretty secure dealing with the customers I've got. When you get into big jobs and you got to sign contracts, it gets hairy. Builders, people who are developers by nature are always on the verge of bankruptcy. There's just too many things to go wrong. I know very, very few developers that really made money. My dad's been in the business for, for since the 50s, and he got hit a lot of times by developers. You get the first job, they pay you, then uh, they try to make a deal with you. Well, I'm going to get all the materials. We're just going to use you for time, and maybe I'll give you 10%. They'd run you two, two, three, four, or five houses. Then, well, I don't have the money until I get the next house started. And then at the end, you get hit four or five grand. So I stay away from developers. Builders, it depends on the builder. The guy's really reputable and I've been working with them for years. You know, sometimes you gotta wait. Now years ago, my dad was putting in cellars. And me and my cousin Bob, we were 16 years old. We were slaves in the summertime. We were carrying block all summer long. He, he would just go in and provide the labor. And he made a deal with the guy. The guy bought all the materials. The, the carpenters put the footers in. They had it all squared up. My dad would go in when he had 13 guys working for him and put the whole cellar in in a day. And some, he was working for four or five builders or developers at the time. You know, some of these cellars would take a week sometimes or real huge cellars or whatever. The playing field has changed the environment. I live in northeastern Pennsylvania. They came out with all these uh, rules and laws and all this other stuff. Uh, attorney generals, you have to have permits, you got to deal with inspectors, you got code officials, you got zoning, you got to have insurances, all this stuff. Back in the 60s and 70s, there was none of that stuff. You could work in any town you wanted, they were glad to see you. Now everybody's trying to stop you. And if you got a crew and uh, you're sitting there for six hours waiting for the inspector to show up so you can pour the footer, you're losing money. A lot of guys, when they started this stuff, got rid of their employees. 
And what they did was they started teaming up with each other. Say the excavator is from this town over here, and he uh, knows everybody on the council and everything, and he's going to do a job. Well, he invites me over and maybe another mason, and then uh, he pays us for our labor, and we're done. I do a lot of one-day jobs. You know, I might go help them pour concrete. I might go help them, uh, you know, put a footer in. I might help them uh, uh, put a doorway in. It one-day jobs from different different contractors I've been working in for for years. Another thing is, uh, what's the definition of a successful contractor? Well, someone whose wife has a good job, and in most cases that's true because since they started all these laws and rules and everything. The wife's a teacher, she's getting health insurance, she's getting that. Regular contractor can't afford to pay all that stuff. So I don't want to keep rambling on. I want to show you uh, the contract that I use when I'm dealing with people. But just to go over what I think I missed, I keep a very small overhead. Instead of me buying a lot of big equipment, I keep what I need. And if I need something, I rent it. And sometimes I have to bid that into the job. You might get on a job and you got to jackhammer something out, so you got to go rent a jackhammer. Uh, got to be careful on what you're taking. Got to realize sometimes you need a permit. A lot of times you don't need a permit. I'll actually want to see where it's in the law that I need a permit. Sometimes when I bid, I'll bid a piece of a job at a time. Someone asked me they wanted to redo the whole cellar and plaster it. And I, I wasn't really sure if they were going to be the happy the way I did it. So I says, well, let me just do... This little piece here, and if you're happy, then we'll continue on. I'll charge you this much for this. Sometimes, uh, years ago, we used to bid by the block, how many block we laid. Sometimes uh, when I write the contract, I'll break it down in, into sections. Like I'm only bidding on the form, forming, and then I'm bidding on the block, and then I'm bidding on uh, the brickwork, and then I'm bidding on the concrete work, and I'll break it all down into different bids. And if you're you're looking at plans, you got to be real careful with plans because you could miss something in a, in a second. A retaining wall, that's the worst thing you could ever do in the masonry business. I'm watching they come out all these new blocks. I'm watching them fall over. I, I never take a retaining job wall anymore. I fix some, uh, but I don't like to take them. I don't bite off more than I could chew. I bid on what I could bid on, and that's it. Thank God I never had to go in, in uh, a court for anything. I'm pretty fortunate. I watch the people I'm working for. If I smell something wrong, I don't go there. So I'm going to show you the contract now. I write very little contracts. Now we're going to talk a little bit about contracts. This is a little contract that I would make up if I did this for a homeowner. Uh, according to the Attorney General in Pennsylvania, anymore you have to be registered with them. $50 for two years and you have to have insurance. So if I was going to write a contract out, it'd be Mike Mason, Mason contractor. I'd put here where I live and my phone number, and I'd have to put my home improvement number that goes by the Attorney General, what that number is. And they have a number where the owner could call up and see if I'm legit. Uh, and then I just put this contract made this date. This is the date I made the contract with the owners, February 32nd. 2017 actually this is the day I'm going to get married put that on your calendar and it's between the homeowner the address and the phone and the contractor which is me Mike the Mason now according to the Attorney General's office they want you to put the date that you're going to start it the approximate date that you're going to start it February 32nd which is the day I'm taking my future ex-wife on uh, her honeymoon and it shall be substantially completed on or before March 32nd. That's required when you do a contract. And you, you tell them what you're paying for. You're going to pay for the uh, materials and labor. And it's for the sum of $500 here because it's a small job. Uh, payment shall be made at fo as follows. Uh, full payment $500 at completion of job. So you could put, like, uh, if you want, you could put uh, you take one-third down they frown at of you taking more than one-third down in Pennsylvania uh, I think a lot of these guys are skipping and running when they get the money so you could do any, anything you want and the contract is to be formed at 1313 Mockingbird Lane uh, because 
this might be different where the actual homeowner is living. So you got to put down exactly where the job is. And I'm re removing the loose cement on the driveway side of the house, approximately 100 square feet. I remove the debris, I patch and apply a new stucco coat, and I put the color, color white, as I was shown on sample. And the price includes all labor and materials. And right here, if you want, sometimes I draw a map, or I draw something that I'm actually going to do. There's the road, there's the driveway, here's the house, and that's where I put the stucco. Then down here at the bottom, the right, re, right of recession. Recession, I can't say that word. Why don't they just say right of cancellation? Everybody would understand it. And the owner may rescind this contract within three business days or any time before work begins. I put that any time before work begins because it doesn't really bother me. But by law, they have three days to rescind that contract or cancel it. And I just put it at any owner at any time if the owner's not satisfied, the owner may stop job and pay a reasonable fee for what has been completed in a workmanlike fashion. And then the Attorney General has a hotline. You could call the toll free hotline for a contract registration with the Attorney General's office. The people could call that up and see that uh, you're legit and if you had any trouble in the past. And then the contractor has to sign it and date it and the owner has to sign and date it. Now there's a lot of different ways to do contracts. You could scribble them out. That's just a real fast scribble job. I don't know if you can see that. But that, that's the basics of it. Uh, I'm not going to get into you know, anything big, but that's the basics of a contract that I would use when I was dealing with a homeowner. Now that little bit of a contract I showed you was a very basic contract and that's what I would recommend as being a beginner. When I bid, someone calls me up and, and asks me for a square foot. How much is a square foot do you charge for concrete? I don't even know. i got to go look at the job. I don't trust that method. It's, uh, if, you're, if you're doing it every day, like guys who do block top, they do it every day. I don't. I'm on a patio one day. I'm on a concrete job the next day. I'm at the stucco doing something else. So I keep a reference book of all my jobs right here. That's a stucco house I did. The other one's a stone patio. And I just, I just go through that. Whatever I did in the past, if it's pavers or whatever I did, I know what I charged and how long it took me to do the job. Like anything else, you get better at it with experience. So my advice is for the young people is just start out doing a real small job. In Pennsylvania, if you make less than $5,000 total, and that's what materials and, and uh, labor, you don't need a license. So you got to find all this stuff out. You got to find out what's going on in your state. So looking at that little contract I, I wrote, let's just say, because you know times are changing, this is 2017, let's just say a contractor like me makes $200 a day. So I know on that stucco job it's going to take me two days. That's running for the materials, that's knocking it off, cleaning it up, taking the stuff to the dump, and finishing the job. And then it's maybe $75 for the materials. I bid the job of $500, just an example. If you're in New York City, maybe you're getting 400 bucks a day. I don't know. I remember going, taking architecture courses, and the teacher said, a rule of thumb is whatever your materials are, you're, you double that, and that's what your labor should be. Does that work? Not all the time. A big deal is, like I said, you got to look at the job. In our area, there's big hills and mountains, and, and sometimes you can't get the stuff in there like you think you can get. These big contractors, just because they're big contractors, don't mean they're making money. So anyway, I put this video together, and I thought it might be interesting. I, I got some ideas from other people who had videos, and I was thinking on doing another video about uh, the business itself, like, should you hire employees? Should you get a business number? Should you go S chapter, S chapter Corporation? Should you just do 1099s? I have a lot of comments about that. Uh, let me know if you think you want to hear anything else. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Haddock, and please subscribe.